Guided Professor Senko Xu. Um, Senko, uh, uh, Senko received his uh, bachelor degree in Tsinghua University and PhD degree in UC Berkeley. And today he will bring us the topology and quantum creativity under weak measurement body cards. So welcome, Senko. Yeah, first I want to uh, thank the organizers for their, for their uh, very kind invitation and give me the opportunity to present some of the recent works that uh, uh, we did in our group. And uh, this, is a, this is a new subject to me as well, and uh, I, I, I feel really excited about it. So I hope that today I can convey uh, the same level of uh, excitement to, uh, to you guys. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so this work was done in collaboration with all these uh, brilliant uh, young people. I, well, actually, actually, they are the mentor of me and introduced me to this uh, uh, new field of quantum information. So, uh, yeah, so basically I will first uh, start with uh, some very simple, explaining some very simple notions such as the coherence and weak measurement. And also, most importantly, I will introduce uh, two different uh, symmetry conditions, which will, uh, which will become very important for the rest of the, uh, the talk. Then I will talk about, uh, mostly focus on two systems, uh, uh, quantum critical points under weak wave measurement or decoherence, and also strange correlator and asymmetry protected topological states uh, under, under weak measurement and decoherence. Uh, and then, uh, if there's a time, I will also talk about the higher form symmetries and uh, how they behave under, under weak measurement. Okay, so, so let's talk about uh, uh, decoherence first. So first of all, so what is decoherence? So basically, a, a, a pure state density, uh, density matrix will become a mixed density matrix or become a, a mixed state ensemble uh, once it becomes uh, weakly entangled with the environment. And we uh, take the entire system and we trace out the environment and actually the uh, density matrix for party system will become, a, will become a, a, a mixed state density matrix. So actually, decoherence is actually can be viewed as the link between the, uh, uh, the quantum realm and also the, uh, and also the classical, classical world. So that means uh, how the uh, quantum system loses the quantum coherence and becomes a, becomes a, a, a classical system. Uh, actually, uh, the process of decoherence can be uh, roughly or very, very uh, intuitively viewed as the uh, quantum system being uh, weakly measured uh, by their environment or by the uh, ancillary spins in their environment. So let me take a one, one very, very simple example to illustrate how this is the case. So the very simple, uh, the simplest uh, quantum system is just a qubit, okay, just a qubit. So let's start with a uh, uh, state like this. It's a superposition position between spin up and spin down, or we can say it's an eigenstate of the sigma x. It's an eigenstate of sigma s equals to, equals to one. So uh, so if we take a density matrix, density matrix will look like this, okay, so i is the, uh, uh, two by two identity matrix, and X is the uh, uh, Pauli matrix sigma X, and this is the density matrix for uh, for this quantity. Okay, it's actually a pure state density matrix. Okay, so the, now let's say that actually uh, we have this density matrix, but actually we let it go through a cloud or channel of uh, ancillary spins, and actually the, the the so what the so what the quantum channel will do is that the quantum channel will have certain probability p to measure this single spin along the z direction. So once it measures the single spin along z direction and we get the uh, consequence or outcome z equals to one, then the density matrix will become this, okay? So it means that this is, so this is the density matrix for sigma spin, uh, sigma z equals to one. And let's say there's another probability p for the environment to measure the single spin and get outcome minus one, okay? So this is a density matrix for the, uh, uh, for the single spin with sigma z equals to minus one. Okay, then actually there's a, uh, another larger probability for the spin to be measured, to, to not be measured at all. Okay, so actually uh, there's a small probability for the single spin to be measured, and there's a uh, uh, probability for the single spin to be measured to be z equals to one, and another probability for z equals to minus one, and a larger probability for the for density matrix to be not measured at all. So this is the outcome. Okay, this is the final density matrix. And this actually is a mixed state density matrix. Okay, it's no longer a pure state. It's actually more like a uh, 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 ensemble now. And actually, so, you know, up to some very, very simple algebra, you can show that actually this uh, decoherent density matrix can look like this. Okay, can be reorganized into something like this. Okay, so I'll be good. This is the uh, simplest uh, quantum, quantum state. Okay, 
But at this point, we already make some uh, uh, comments about the, about the symmetry, which is very, very important here. So the initial spin, sorry, initial spin state, okay, it's a uh, symmetric state. Suppose I view the symmetry as a sigma x, okay, so, so let's say x is the z2 symmetry generator, then this uh, pure state is going to be invariant under the action of the x operator from the left, okay, is that right? But then this uh, density matrix will be invariant under the x operation from both the left and the right separately. Okay, so it seems like the density matrix has enlarged the symmetry. Okay, it's invariant under the both left and right symmetry actions. Okay, so actually we call this as a, a double symmetry condition. And in some literature, they call it a strong symmetry condition, but they mean, they mean the, 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 the same thing. Okay, but then let's look at this a decoherent density matrix. Okay, the decoherent density matrix, you can see it's obviously no longer invariant under separate left action and right action. Okay, because if I do the x action, this z will actually change uh, change sign because I'm the commutation between x and z. However, it is still invariant on the simultaneous action of x from the left and right. Okay, is that right? Okay, simultaneously, if I ask this density from x and um, from left and right, it's still going to be invariant. Okay, so that means that this deco this decoherent density matrix will break the double symmetry of the original density matrix to a diagonal symmetry. Okay, so it means that this density matrix has a weaker symmetry than the original uh, uh, pure state density matrix. Okay, so we can say the pure state density matrix has double symmetry z2 left and z2 right, but actually uh, the, the decoherent density matrix only has the uh, uh, diagonal symmetry. Okay, of course, the decoherent density matrix also does not have to have a diagonal symmetry. Okay, so both, I mean, the reason it has a diagonal symmetry is because as we sum over the two measurement outcomes, z equals one and z equals minus one, we sum over them with an equal amplitude. Okay, this is that we, we don't have any post-selection. Okay, but suppose we post-select the measurement outcome. Let's say I prefer z equals one. Okay, I give z equals one a larger probability than z equals minus one, or, you know, or in other words, then actually, then actually the decoherent density matrix will have no symmetry at all. Okay, we have no symmetry at all. Okay, so now we have uh, three different symmetry conditions, a double symmetry, a diagonal symmetry, and no symmetry at all, okay, for the decoherent density matrix. Okay, so this will become very important later. Yeah. Right, okay, so actually this is generally true, these symmetry conditions are generally true for a quantum many body system, okay, for a quantum many body system. So let's say that I start with a, uh, the pure state density matrix for a quantum many body system, it can be a very complicated, it can be a very complicated density matrix, okay? Then I still let it go through a cloud of ancillary spins and actually, uh, you know, it can, it can uh, entangle with the, with the ancillary spins in a very complicated way, you know, but, but suppose we want to avoid talking about the details of the entanglement, we can still just look at the symmetries, okay? So, for example, suppose the ancillary spins is entangled, it's always entangling, with, for example, something like energy density of the system. Okay, we know energy density of the system is usually very symmetric. Okay, symmetric under order internal symmetries. Okay, so suppose the ancillary spins only entangle with quantities like the uh, energy density, then eventually the uh, the decohered density matrix, even though even though it's a mixed density matrix, is supposed to have the same double symmetry as the original density matrix. Okay, as long as the ancillary spin only entangle with the with the symmetrical qualities in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the system. But suppose the, uh, suppose the uh, environment and zero space entangle with the quantities which, has not, uh, which is not non-trivial under symmetry condition, okay? However, we actually sum over all the measurement outcomes without any bias. I'm supposed to get a diagonal symmetry. Okay, I'm supposed to get a diagonal symmetry. Okay, so it means that actually, uh, uh, depending on how the system is entangled with the environment, I can get a different symmetry condition for the for the for the for the outcome of the of the decohered uh, uh, density matrix. So I mean, why do I emphasize so much about the symmetry condition? Okay, because I eventually I'm going to try to use a field theory or coarse grain theory to describe the decoherence and weak measurement, and we know that in those kind of formally, the symmetry is the most important thing we need to keep track of. Okay, once we use a field theory, okay, we lose a lot of uh, information at a microscopic level, but a symmetry is the one thing that we absolutely have to keep track of, okay? Okay, so how do we describe a, uh, describe a quantum many body system in general, okay? So let's say that actually, we, I mean, so let's start with a pure state density matrix, and we know that there is a uh, path integral 
formally then to describe a, a pure state density matrix. Okay, so let's say that this is my pure state density matrix, and the phi is some field, okay, or cold screen, icing spin, or something like that. Okay, and this uh, density matrix element sandwiched between configuration phi one x and configuration phi two. Okay, this density matrix can be viewed as a path integral in the Euclidean space time. Okay, but I fix the boundary, I fix the tau equals zero configuration to be phi one, and I fix the tau equals to beta uh, 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 configuration to be phi two, and I sum over all the possible uh, intermediate states, intermediate path of the phi, okay, and, and with, a, with a weight given by the action of the system, and I eventually take the beta to infinity limit, okay? So this actually is a standard path integral way of actually, uh, uh, of actually uh, uh, how we compute a, a, a density matrix. Okay, so in condensed matter field, normally we don't really care about the matrix element of density matrix. We just uh, we just have to take a trace. Okay, if we take a trace of the density matrix, it means that we are just uh, identifying phi one and phi two. Okay, but actually we can do a lot more than just taking a trace. Okay, we we are, we're, we're going to discuss other qualities other than taking a trace of the of the density matrix. So we care about the uh, matrix element. Okay. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, so what does the decoherence do? Okay, so just like the simplest example I showed you before, but just like the simplest example I showed you before, the decoherence sounds, I mean, it looks like it's always going to be some operator times the uh, uh, product from the left and some operator product of, from, from, the, from the right. So generally, a decoherent channel can be written like this. Okay, so after decoherence, uh, the system becomes, a, uh, 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 becomes uh, some, some form like this. And the K is called the Krauss operator. Okay, the K is some Krauss operator multiplied from the left and multiplied from the right. So in the field theory language, this seems like uh, the decoherence is just like we operate, we turn on some operation, we turn on some extra operation at tau equals zero and also at tau equals to beta. Okay, is that right? The decoherence in this path integral formula is mapped to some extra terms, extra terms we turn on in the system actually at the tau equals zero and the tau equals beta. Okay, so that means that actually suppose P is small, okay, we exponentiate all the uh, uh, non-trivial Krauss operators, okay, then the, then the effect of weak measurement or decoherence will become an extra term in the path integral action. Okay, and this extra term will become some interacting term, okay, between the tau equals zero and tau equals beta. It's a highly non-local term. Okay, the highly non-local term in the density matrix. Okay, so now suppose I want to study, suppose I want to study the density matrix of a decoherent density matrix, okay, then this is what we want to use in a path integral form. Okay, in the path integral form. Okay. Uh -huh. When you say non local, you mean the tau equals zero, tau equals beta, correct? Yes, right, they are non local. But yeah, of course, once you take a trace, they become local. But since we are looking at one of these more than just a trace, so actually, you know, sometimes it will become very, very non local. Okay. Yeah, right. So actually, how do we determine the form of this uh, in extra interaction term? Okay, now this is a symmetry comes in. Okay, now the symmetry really comes in. Okay, so let's imagine we have like a system with the ON symmetry. Okay, system with the ON symmetry. And suppose the decoherent channel preserve the full ON symmetry. Okay, and then the decoherent density matrix has a full ON, I mean, has the doubled ON symmetry. Then this term can only involve the magnitude of phi. Okay, the magnitude. So, so this term we have like a phi square at tau equals zero and a phi square at tau equals beta, all their interaction. Okay, all the interaction. But suppose the system only keeps a, a diagonal ON symmetry. Okay, Keep, only keeps a diagonal ON symmetry. Then this term can include the terms like a phi vector at tau equals zero dot phi vector at tau equals beta. Okay, so the symmetry dictates interaction. It's also true in the decohered uh, uh, situation. Okay, also true in the decohered situation. Okay, so actually, uh, yeah, right. So as I said, actually, this is a coarse grain formalism. We don't have to care so much. We don't have to care so much about the microscopic details. Okay, but we can use a field theory. We can use RG and all these uh, techniques that are familiar with from the uh, uh, quantum antibody system to study to study this kind of uh, uh, problems. Okay. Uh, yeah. Also, you can see that actually uh, now the effect of decoherence is mapped to some effect on the temporal boundary. Okay, so let's build the imaginary time tau as the temporal direction. 
And then this extra term becomes some kind of interaction or extra term on the temporal boundaries. Okay, on the temporal boundaries. And suppose the system has some uh, emergent Lorentz invariance or space-time rotation symmetry, then we can do space-time rotation. Okay, then this term becomes some uh, a bound, real boundary physics. Okay, becomes some real boundary physics. Okay, is that clear? So now suppose we are looking for interesting problems to study. Okay, so let's so let's ask ourselves. What kind of a system can have interesting physics under decoherence or weak measurement? Okay, then the question is transformed into what kind of system can have non-trivial interesting boundary effects? Okay, then there's some obvious answers. Then there's some obvious answers. For example, the SPT states, okay, definitely have non-trivial boundary, boundary physics. Okay, this is definitely the case. So that means that uh, it's very much worth to study the SPT states, okay, symmetry per topology states under weak measurement and decoherence, because we know that this will map to some effect as a boundary. Okay, obviously there was some interesting physics there, which I will discuss in the second part of the, of the talk. Another, another system with non-trivial boundary effect is the quantum criticality. Okay, basically uh, uh, for a critical point, there's some non-trivial boundary physics going on. Okay, so this actually was started way before SPT. Okay, this was actually started a long time ago. It just uh, is not that familiar to the modern day uh, physics community anymore, but I will I will review that. So this was first observed in uh, in this paper by the Berkeley group. So they studied the decoherent effect of the of the uh, uh, liquid of Lapinger liquid, and they mapped the effect into the uh, boundary physics or the defect physics, as I as I just mentioned. So in the first part of my talk, I will talk about higher dimensional quantum critical points, such as the Wilson Fisher fixed point uh, under weak measurement and decoherence. And actually, how this is mapped to uh, the boundary criticality of the Wilson Fisher uh, fixed point. Okay. So before I start, is there any question? Yeah. Okay. So let me uh, first uh, let's say that. Uh, okay. Let's you know. So suppose I start with a, uh, a system. This action. Okay. This action is like a Jones Landau theory. Jones Landau theory for the O n vector. Okay. Jones Landau for the O n vector with a phi quarter. And then the, the measurement, sorry, the uh, effect of peak coherence and, and, and weak measurement is matched, as I said, to some kind of for interacting term as the temporal boundary, okay, as the temporal boundary. So before I discuss, seriously discuss the effect of decoherence on the O.N. Wilson Fisher fixed point, so let me review some basics about the uh, uh, boundary, about the boundary criticality, okay, what happens as the boundary of a, uh, of a bound uh, critical point. So let's say that I have a, a 5 4 theory, okay, just a uh, just standard 5 4 theory in a D dimensional box. Okay, this D is a classical dimension, okay, so let's, let's, so let's think about it. You know, capital D is always a classical dimension, okay, a D dimensional box. Okay, so there, now there are two tuning parameters in general, okay, two tuning parameters. This R is the mass term in the bulk, in the D dimensional bulk, okay, and this epsilon phi square is the uh, mass term. As the boundary. Okay, let's assume. So, for example, I have a d dimensional IC model. Okay, d dimensional IC model. And in the bulk, this R tuned by the uh, tuned by the, the, the ratio between the icing coupling and the, and the temperature. Okay, and then this epsilon corresponds to the icing coupling as the boundary. So let's so let's assume that I can I can I can freely choose the icing coupling as the boundary and also the icing coupling in the bulk. So I have two tuning parameters. Okay, R and epsilon. And I want to focus on the case when the bulk is at criticality, which means that I want to tune R equals to zero. Okay, R equals zero. So let's look at this one. Okay, so now actually there are two obvious scenarios. One is that epsilon is greater than one, sorry, uh, greater than zero. Suppose epsilon is greater than zero, okay, it means that even though the bulk is at the critical point, the boundary does not want to be at the critical point. Okay, the boundary has an extra master. Okay, the boundary has an extra mass. The boundary actually does not want to feel the criticality, but it, but the criticality is somehow unavoidable. Okay, because actually the bulk is critical. So even though the boundary epsilon is greater than zero, if we measure the correlation function between phi, okay, close to the boundary, okay, I'm not going to see a exponential decay. Okay, even though the boundary has a greater than zero master, but because the bulk is critical. If I measure the, the, the phi phi correlation near the boundary, I'm still going to see a power law decay. But the power, okay, the scaling dimension as a boundary, the power is going to be greater than the Wilson Fisher 
than the than the scaling dimension in the bulk. Okay, so at, at, at large D, okay, at large D, this is the scaling dimension for the phi or the parameter in the bulk. But close to the boundary, uh, the scaling dimension will be larger, larger than this. So, larger. so this is the case where epsilon is greater than zero. Yes. So you already one thing, but at the critical point, if you do some deep interference, you may destroy the critical point. Yeah. That's a naive picture. The things that's a since appear in the picture, you say that the the measurement only is the boundary. Yes, so right. You already affect top. So since the the decomposition don't destroy critical point. Yeah, so that's a sorry. Contradiction here. No, 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 that's. It's, it's not a contradiction. It's, it's just uh, I, I, I forgot to mention one, one important thing at the beginning. Okay, this is just a very shallow quantum circuit. It means that it's a very weak decoherence. You know, so of course, if you turn on like a, uh, you know, so if I expose my system to the environment long enough, okay, the system will fully thermalize. It's not a weak measurement uh, anymore. It's very strong decoherence. It's, it's, you know, so the system will thermalize. Actually, you know, of course, the quantum field quantum will, will totally be ruined. So here I'm talking about a weak decoherence. Yeah, when so, so, when so that related to the question here, that the, uh, because when you do the measurement of some decoherence, you may do it at a different time. So that looks like uh, uh, it's not at the same time. So it's a yeah, this looks not a surface effect. Uh, Say again, sorry. It's, it's may not be a surface effect. So it's a hard. So what kind of measurement do you give you purely surface effect? Basically. You say that's mathematically just some payoff pressure act on the side. But uh, can you realize the uh, uh, many different payoff pressure using uh, one uh, uh, what, what I'm thinking is that you will have decoherence, you, you do many measurements. But, but many, many measurements at a different time. And uh, then oh. uh, those are many measurements at different times can be described by this. Uh, Act on the, yeah, on the I mean, side. By, by different time, I think you mean just the depth of real the circuit. Time. Yeah, oh. real, real time. But here I'm talking about a very, very shallow depth. Just okay. a, yeah, just a, you know, we, we, or in real time, it, it just means that I, I expose the system to the environment for a very short amount of time. Oh. The entanglement is very, very weak. You know, so it's, okay. it justifies I treat the, I treat the crowd server as a perturbation. In their in their in their in their in their uh, exponential. Right. If I expose for long enough, or it's a very very uh, long depth of, or a deep depth, or, you know, a uh, uh, quantum circuit, then this formula will fail. This formula will fail. So will the fail. measurement. Uh, oh yes. A uniform, like, yeah. A, a few, maybe just a, a few a few a few steps. Yes. A, a few steps. Time. Yeah. Right. So a very short time. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Exactly. So after a very long time, this formula will no longer be valid. So we're just only talk about talking about the shallow quantum circuit here. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, uh, so uh, where was okay? Yeah. Right. So yeah. So uh, right. So so I'm, so I'm trying to say that actually, uh, uh, so when epsilon is greater than zero, okay, the boundary correlation function will still be parallel, but actually uh, it's going to have a power much bigger than, uh, well, not much bigger, but some somewhat bigger than the bulk critical point. Okay, another interesting scenario is when epsilon is negative. Okay, when epsilon is negative, it means like in the icing in the icing model, I tune the icing coupling as the boundary much stronger than the bulk. Okay, it means epsilon is, is, is negative. So now it looks like the, uh, uh, the the boundary wants to order. Okay, even before the bulk. Okay, wants to order even before the bulk. Okay, so in general, when dimension d is very high, when dimension d is very high, indeed, there can be a situation where the boundary is ordered even before the bulk is ordered. Okay, so there could be a phase here with the boundary order, but actually a bulk is in this order. So actually in this case, this line here is called an extraordinary uh, boundary condition. And this is called an ordinary boundary condition. Okay, ordinary boundary condition. Okay, but now this phase diagram obviously is wrong for D equals to three. Okay, obviously has a problem when dimension D equals three, which is uh, which is the dimension that we care about the most. Okay, dimension we care about the most. The, the, the reason is that suppose I have an ON symmetry, and I consider an ON Wilson Fisher fixed point. Okay, so we know that here, as the boundary is going to be d equals to two. Okay, capital dimension d equals to two. And at d equals to two, the ON vector cannot order. Okay, we cannot have spontaneous symmetry breaking for the ON vector at the, at a d equals two. Okay, so it means actually uh, there's some issue about the extraordinary uh, boundary. Okay, extraordinary boundary. So this, there's a mermin Wagner theorem which says that ON vector cannot order spontaneously. At a two dimension, okay, without the bulk being ordered. Okay, 
So what's the resolution here? Okay, what's the resolution? So it turns out that this actually was, I mean, as I said before, the boundary precarity is actually a very old subject, but actually this phase theorem is only understood very recently. Okay, uh, the, the one who actually made the most contribution to this was, uh, uh, was Max uh, uh, Maliski from MIT. And he discovered that actually, uh, suppose I have a D equals to three bulk and a D equals two boundary, okay, then uh, at this part of the phase diagram, the phi will actually have an extraordinary log correlation, okay, which means this. The phi phi correlation as the boundary, okay, is here is d equals two boundary and d equals three bound. The phi phi correlation will be almost long range order, okay, almost long range order, but actually it decays as a log x, okay, decays a log x. So actually, this actually is very, very interesting, okay, it's actually different from any ordinary uh, critical behavior. Ordinary critical behavior will give you a power law decay, but here is a one over log x decay. It's almost long range correlated. Okay, so this has been seen in numerics, you know, simulation as well. Okay, in recent numerics. Okay, so how does this, uh, how does this uh, map to our problem? So let's come back to our problem. Okay, so let's say that my system, I initially, I initially prepare a state, which is at the Owen Wilson Fisher critical point. Okay, now I'm talking about a two dimensional, two spatial dimension, quantum critical system, okay, quantum critical system. And I prepare the system to be at the wave function of the Wilson Fisher fixed point with Owen symmetry. And then I let the system weakly exposed to the environment, okay, weakly exposed to the environment. And then I take out, then I take the uh, Deagle here, then matrix, and I perform, uh, perform the uh, measurement, I mean, sorry, uh, I, I, I try to measure the, uh, uh, the correlation function, okay, try to measure the correlation function. So now you see that if I marry the ordinary correlation function, it becomes the trace okay, of density matrix. And the trace of density matrix actually will identify the two boundaries tau equals zero and tau equals beta. Okay? So it's like, so now actually uh, uh, this problem becomes like I insert a defect. I insert a defect in the space time. Okay? Insert a defect in the, in the space time. And actually, uh, as I said before, depending on whether we have double the symmetry, or diagonal symmetry, okay? So the, the term, the form of the interacting term can be different. For example, if I have a double symmetry, I can have like a phi square <coughs> and tau equals zero and a phi square tau equals beta. And if I have a diagonal symmetry, sorry, if I only have a diagonal symmetry, then I can have like the phi tau equals zero dot phi uh, tau equals beta. But suppose I only take a trace, okay? It does not really matter because I'm gonna identify them as well. However, there will be an extra epsilon term. Okay, there will be an extra epsilon term as the defect. Okay, and it's a 2D defect. Okay, 2D defect. Okay, so, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, there's a subtle point that, that, I mean, this requires a little bit of uh, post selection, but actually, uh, if you allow me, I'm gonna skip uh, explaining the subtlety here. So it turns out that actually the conclusion would be that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, decoherence effect is mapped to either the boundary or the defect problem. When, uh, inserted in the in the in the space time picture. <laughs> and so it means that suppose I start with suppose I start with a wave function, which is the Wilson Fisher wave function for the ON symmetry, and after it exposed to the environment a little bit, then uh, when I measure the uh, correlation function of the of, of the order parameter, I'm not going to see the standard of Wilson Fisher uh, power law anymore. Okay, I'm going to see something different, very different. I'm going to either see the boundary criticality or I'm going to see the extraordinary log, okay, depending on the sign of the uh, sign of epsilon, okay, depending on the sign of, of the epsilon, okay. So let me remind you, okay, this measurement, this this calculation is done in the bulk, is a 2D bulk, okay. It's just the mathematically this problem is mapped to uh, the boundary the, the, the boundary problem, but actually this calculation is, is done in the two dimensional bulk, okay, two dimensional bulk, okay. So this is actually not measured as a boundary. It's not measured as a boundary, okay. So, I mean, the field theory actually will give you this uh, prediction. Of course, actually, it's somewhat difficult to predict what it actually, uh, what exactly is epsilon, okay? What's the sign of, of the epsilon from the field theory? Because then we will have to make connection. We will have to make an exact connection between field theory parameters and microscope parameters, which is always uh, uh, difficult to do. But here, the field theory will, will predict that uh, you, you should see either this or that, okay? But not the standard Wilson Fisher fixed point. So the Wilson Fisher fixed point will be fragile, okay, will be fragile under the weak measurement or decoherence. And this is a consequence of a, of it's a, of a, of why it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's fragile. Okay. A question? Uh, is there any way to do the weak measurement such that you realize the, 
binary case and not the defect case? Uh, that will require, yeah, that will uh, that will require you know computing something called the, the fidelity, uh, which I will get to later in the second part of the talk. Yeah, right. Yeah. So so yeah, I will I will, yeah I will explain that uh, later. Okay, so this is the ordinary correlation function, which is always linear with the density matrix, okay? But suppose we look at something which is nonlinear with density matrix, okay? So for example, the second Arrhenian entropy. Okay, this is something difficult to measure experimentally, but actually, uh, well, we can, we can still look at it. We can still compute what, what happens there, okay? So now you can see that actually, uh, this is just a square of a two density matrix, and actually the decoherence effect will become some uh, interaction between the two boundaries, but we are not gluing the two boundaries together. Okay, we actually are uh, uh, gluing the one boundary from one density matrix and another boundary of another density matrix. So in the space-time picture, this will become some decoherence that will become some very non-local interactions between uh, this uh, temporal defect, sorry, this temporal defect and this temporal defect. Okay, then after space-time rotation, this becomes some um, uh, some, 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 some interaction between the two spatial defect, okay, interaction between, so this is very non-local, okay, this is very non-local, but this still can be studied using RG, okay, this still can be studied using, using RG, okay, so it means that when we evaluate in the second Rennie entropy, okay, the evaluation becomes performing a path integral in this kind of space-time, okay, but with, with some extra, with some extra non-local interaction between the two defects, okay, inserted in the, in the space-time. Space Okay, so actually, uh, what uh, phenomena can we can we observe? Okay, so we've tried different uh, field theory models, and we see that actually, well, I mean, sometimes even if we have a double symmetry to, to begin with, okay, double symmetry to begin with, this kind of extra interaction term, okay, can cause spontaneous symmetry breaking. You can spontaneously break the double symmetry down to a diagonal symmetry. Okay, can spontaneously break double symmetry down to a diagonal symmetry. It's spontaneous symmetry breaking. But this spontaneous symmetry breaking, well, somehow is hidden in the second Rennie entropy. Okay, it means that if I calculate the second Rennie entropy and I tune the parameter, I'm going to see the singularity, some singularity at some point, which corresponds to the phase transition, which is associated with the spontaneous symmetry breaking from a double symmetry to diagonal symmetry. Okay, but actually, you know, uh, yeah. So we also tested this with a lattice model. Okay, this was a field theory calculation. We also tested it with a lattice model, exact calculation with a lattice model. So let's say that we start with just a two, sorry, so let's say that we, we start with a, the original density matrix, which is the icing disorder state. Just the, all the spin is polarizing to the right direction. Okay, the product of sigma x, if sigma x is one state. Okay, so like sigma x equals one state. And then I turn on the decoherence on the icing coupling. Okay, turn on decoherence on I come in ZIZJ term. Okay, ZIZJ term. And then actually, uh, now if I want to calculate the uh, second Rennie entropy, okay, second Rennie entropy, it becomes like a two copies of a, become a two copies of a parallel magnet with some, uh, with some uh, a ZZ coupling on the top layer and a ZZ coupling on the bottom layer. Okay, then when this coupling is strong enough, it's going to cause a condensation of the icing spin, it's a bound state of the icing spin from both layers, okay? And this condensation actually spontaneously breaks the doubled icing symmetry down to diagonal icing symmetry, okay? It's going to break the doubled icing symmetry to the diagonal icing symmetry, okay? And also, we know that uh, the Z2 paramagnet has a dual, okay, to the uh, deconfined phase of the Tori code model, okay? In, in this, uh, this is the dual duality between the uh, icing disorder phase and the, and the, and the, uh, the uh, uh, Tori code model, the, uh, the, the topological order. And then uh, this phase transition I was talking about, precisely is mapped to, I take an E anion from, the, from one layer and another E anion from the bottom layer, and they form a bound state and condense, okay? Form a bound state and condense, okay? So this is like actually uh, uh, we break the two Z2 gauge symmetry down to one Z2 gauge symmetry. Okay, we break spontaneous break two Z2 gauge symmetry down to one Z2 gauge symmetry. Okay, or maybe in the language of Xiao Gang, this actually we break the categorical symmetry to a diagonal uh, 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 categorical symmetry. Okay, and actually this actually, I mean, this kind of a transition, uh, we can call it information transition because actually we know Tori code can be encoded with some quantum information and then actually uh, this conversation will lose some uh, quantum information encoded in the Tori code model. 
Okay, but this actually can 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 be seen only in this kind of a rainy entropy, or actually suppose I suppose I actually uh, uh, turn on decoherence on Tori Tori model and I calculate the rainy entropy, then actually this model will be mapped to the uh, uh, will be mapped to the uh, uh, Nishimori line of the of the uh, uh, random bound IC model. Okay, it has a different uh, criticality, but actually it's also a transition. It's also a transition driven by the decoherence on the de on the on the Tori Tori model. Okay, uh, question. Uh, oh, in which case that we're talking about here? Uh, sorry, the icing. Yeah, yeah, the icing case, the deal is like we, we measure the ZZ coupling. It's not it's not flipping one spin. We measure the ZZ coupling. Well, okay. Yeah. Uh, so suppose I change the channel to like a depolarized channel. Say again, sorry. If I change the decoherence channel to the depolarizing channel, yeah, right. This are a series of papers studying that. Uh, certainly, different channel will give a different, a very different physics. Yeah, uh, I, I probably cannot give you a complete picture right now. Certainly, yeah, right. it, it has been studied a lot actually. Well, especially for one DIC model. Turn on, you can have like a ZZ. I mean, just like deco defacing on Z operator, defacing on X operator or Y operator. So each of them will map to the conformal boundary condition. You know, so they will map to boundary, of course. They will. So each of them will map to the conformal boundary condition. So there's a literature on that. So I can, I can forward the literature later, you know, if you like. But but yeah, indeed, different the different channels certainly will map to different the uh, map models. Yeah. Okay. So this is the uh, decoherence on the critical point. So now, what about uh, symmetry project topological state? Okay, SPD state. Well, actually, here let me say that uh, we want to study uh, symmetry protected topological ensemble. Okay, uh, because actually we are quite, we are going to talk about a. Uh, we are going to talk about a, uh, a mixed state. Okay, we want to talk about whether a mixed state density matrix can have some SPT features or not. Okay, so let's call it an SPT uh, ensemble with the SPT basis. Okay, so let me first introduce a notion called a strange correlator, which is something that we played with like uh, maybe well, uh, 10, 10, 10 years ago already. Okay, so uh, we want, I mean, back then we were looking at this quality. Okay, this quality. This looks like a correlation, but actually it's, it's, it's not a correlation. Okay, so let's say that psi. It's a SPT wave function. Okay, it's a bulk S, it's a bulk SPT wave function, and omega is a trivial state wave function. Okay, trivial state wave function, and then O is the order parameter of the symmetry that we use to define the SPT. Okay, to define the SPT state, we need some symmetry. So this O is the uh, order parameter for that symmetry. So let's try to evaluate this guy. Okay, so it turns out that actually, uh, you know, in the space-time path integral formula, then again, so this quantity can be built. As I evolve this psi, you know, along the tau direction, okay, with the SPT Hamiltonian, okay, and this omega can be viewed as I evolve, uh, uh, you know, uh, along the minus tau direction with a trivial Hamiltonian, okay, with a trivial Hamiltonian. Then this quantity can be viewed as a correlation function of the O operator as the temporal interface, okay, as a temporal interface between the uh, between between the uh, uh, trivial state Hamiltonian and a uh, non-trivial state Hamiltonian. Okay, between the trivial state Hamiltonian and SPD Hamiltonian. Okay, but then actually after space-time rotation, okay, suppose the system, suppose the system has a space-time symmetry again. After space-time rotation, then this quantity becomes the correlation function as a spatial interface between the SPD state and also a trivial state. And here we know for sure that this this correlation function, I mean this quantity, cannot be trivially uh, exponential decay. So it cannot be trivially uh, exponential decay, okay? Because uh, because after space-time rotation, we know that the spatial boundary of the of SPD state must have some uh, trivial physics going on, okay? Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, well, so so you know, back then we proposed this as a diagnosis for any wave function, okay? For example, if someone give me a wave function. A bulk wave function of some um, quantum metabolic system, maybe maybe the wave function generated by numericals or something like that. Okay, and we want to tell whether this wave function is a SPT wave function or a trivial wave function. Okay, so what do we do? Okay, so we just uh, compute this guy. Okay, suppose it shows a power law correlation or long range correlation. Okay, actually this actually indicates or strongly suggests this psi is going to be a uh, SPT state. Okay, it's going to be a, a, a SPT state. And actually, over the years, this quantity has been tested by many, many groups. And while well, they tested on AKLT state for many SPD state, uh, many, many different things. Okay, 
But let me say that actually this quantity is supposed to work for one, generally work for 1D and 2D uh, SPD state. The reason I have a reservation about 3D is because we know that the three dimensional, sorry, the, the two dimensional boundary of a three dimensional SPD phase can have a topological order. Okay, it means that this, this interface, suppose it's 3D, okay? The interface here actually can have a topological order. If the interface have a topological order, then it cannot be diagnosed with a correlation function. Okay, that's the only, it, it's, a, it's an exotic possibility, but actually it's, a, it's a one logical possibility that we need to clarify, okay? But actually this quantity is supposed to work well for 1D and 2D SPD state. Okay. Okay, so let's test this uh, quantity first. Okay, so let's start with the simplest uh, one-dimensional SPD state. Okay, this actually is uh, an SPD state with a Z2 plus Z2 symmetry. Here I use the two colors. Okay, and this is the Hamiltonian. Okay, this is Hamiltonian. So uh, you can see that actually, um, so after some simple algebra, you can see that actually every term, so every term, the first term here, they commute with each other. It's a sum over a bunch of commuting projectors. They sum over a bunch of commuting projectors. But the H term, and the H term does not commute with all of them. Okay, so H term will, so, so if I only have the first term, the system is already the SPD state, but the system will be at the fixed point of the SPD state with a zero correlation. And the second term will actually uh, move the system away from the, from, the, from the fixed point and give the system a finite correlation length. Okay, and actually there's a, there's a phase diagram when H is smaller than one, the system is always going to be in the SPD state. And then when H is greater than one, you can see that all the spin will be polarized. Obviously, it's going to be a trivial state. Okay, so there's a phase diagram. When H is more than one, it's SPD. When H greater than one, it's a, it's a it's trivial. And the critical point is going to be just a, a two copies of icing transition. Okay, or just C equals one CFT. Okay. And this is Z2. Okay, so the Z2 cross, so Z2 green and the Z2 red, they correspond to the icing symmetry on the even size and the odd size, respectively. Okay, so this uh, this model has two Z2 symmetries. Okay, one is the all the Z2 chart on the even side, the other is Z2 chart on the on the odd side. And let's try to calculate this quantity. Okay, let's try to calculate this quantity. And let's turn on decoherence on the even spin. Sorry, uh, let's, sorry. Let me let me not, not not turn on any decoherence first. Okay, let's just look at this uh, red line here. This is the red line without any decoherence at all. Just to benchmark, just to benchmark this. Uh, uh, strain forward. You can see that actually uh, it does, the correlation function does saturate to a constant, okay, it does saturate to a constant as, uh, as, as, as claimed, okay, so it means that this correlation function actually is supposed to uh, be non-trivial, it saturate to a constant. So let me remind you that suppose I calculate a regular correlation function, ZV correlation function, for either omega or psi, it's going to be short range, okay, so regular correlation function will be short range for SPD state, because SPD state is a disordered state. Okay, but this uh, overlapping correlation or the strain correlator can have a long range correlation. Okay, and this happens when H is smaller than one. And in this particular figure, H equals to one half. Okay, so this means that this system is actually away from the fixed point wave function, but actually is inside the SPD phase. Okay, so the correlator, I mean, the strain correlator will saturate to a, uh, to a constant. Okay, at a long distance. Okay, so since now we are talking about a decohere density matrix, so we need to generalize the notion of strain correlator into, into a density matrix form, okay, into density matrix form. So as I said before, when we define the, when we define the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, strain correlator for a pure state wave function, the wave function is just a, a one interface, just a one boundary of a density matrix, okay? But since we are talking about the density matrix, we need to worry about a both boundaries of the both interface or both temporal boundaries of the of density matrix. Then actually, uh, we can we can devise two different kind of uh, strain correlator, you know, for the density matrix. One is this one, okay? One take this one. So this form of the uh, this this form we call a type one strain correlator, and this type one strain correlator is like we insert the order parameter at one temporal interface between the SPT density matrix and the trivial density matrix, okay, the type one strain correlator. And the type two strain correlator looks like this, it's more complicated, but actually uh, it means that we insert the, uh, uh, the O operator, the order parameter, oper sorry, the order parameter at the both interface between the SPT wave function and the trivial wave function, okay, the trivial wave function. 
So actually, we can just use these notions, okay? Because now this row does not have to be a, 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 a pure state density matrix anymore. So we can use uh, both quantities to define symmetry protected topological ensembles. Okay, symmetry protected topological ensembles. Okay. Yeah. So let's see how it works. So let's say that we turn on decoherence on the green Z2. Okay, and actually, we, I mean, as I said before. If I use the density matrix formally, then, then the symmetry will double. Okay, symmetry will double. So originally, the uh, symmetry will be so the uh, for, for the quantum system symmetry, the green Z2 cross red Z2. But since we use the, the uh, density matrix, the symmetry becomes like a, a doubled green Z2 and a doubled red Z2. But let's say the decoherent channel breaks the doubled green Z2 down to a diagonal Z2. Okay, diagonal green Z2. So it means actually the, uh, for, the, for the density matrix, the symmetry becomes a single green Z2 and a double red Z2. Okay, double red Z2. And now again, let's try to calculate the uh, strain correlator. Okay, so now we can see that for a type 1 strain correlator, okay, for the type 1 strain correlator with a little bit decoherence, type 1 strain correlator will decay to zero. Okay, decay to zero. So it means that in some way, some way, in some way, the, uh, uh, the, the, the SPD state. Is, is somehow trivialized, okay? It's somehow trivialized by the uh, uh, by the by the decoherence, okay? By the decoherence, okay? By the symmetry breaking decoherence, the symmetry reduced the double D two to diagonal D two, okay? However, the type two strain correlator is still saturated to a constant, okay? Type two strain is still saturated to a constant, okay? So this means actually in some scenarios we know that uh, we should use the type two strain correlator as a diagnosis for a symmetry protein topological ensemble. Okay, because actually uh, uh, when other tools fail, at least this tool still suggests this ensemble is a non-trivial, it's a non-trivial ensemble. Okay, it's a non-trivial ensemble. By the way, let me also say that actually the type one strain correlator, at least for this particular case, is tightly related to what is called the string order parameter. Okay, string order parameter for the SPD state. And the previous studies already show that the under this kind of decoherence, precisely this kind of decoherence, the string order parameter for the for the for the Z2 cross Z2 SPD will become short range correlated. It will become short range after we turn on decoherence. But now we say that uh, you know if we look at something different, if we look at type two strain correlator, we can still get something long range. So it means that the system, the, the ensemble is not trivialized. Okay, there's still some information about the SPD state which is remained retained in the uh, mixed state density matrix. Okay? But we need to look at the type two strain correlator to extract that information. Okay, so this is the uh, type one, type two strain correlator without any decoherence, but as a function of h, you can see that, that both of them precisely vanish. Okay, at h equal one, and, and uh, which you know, which is supposed to be the case because h equals one is the is the critical point. Okay, it is a critical point between SPD and trivial state. So we can say that uh, both type one, type two strain correlator, the satur I mean, they, their saturation value will go to zero when uh, h equals two, h, uh, h equals one. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so these are numerics. Okay, so what are the physical pictures? Okay, how do we understand it using intuitive and naive physical pictures? Okay, so let's do this. So as I said before, uh, the decoherence effect is mapped to the interaction between two boundaries. Okay, two boundaries, okay, very naively. So what is the boundary of a one-dimensional Z2 cross Z2 SPD? Turns out the one-dimensional Z2 cross Z2 SPD is just the whole damn face. Okay, it's, it's no mystery, just a hot emphasis. And the boundary is just a spin one half. Okay, it's a projective wrap of Z2 cross Z2. Okay, projective wrap of, of, of Z2 cross Z2. And one Z2 can be viewed as a pi rotation around the X axis. The other Z2 is a pi rotation around the Z axis. Okay, around the Z axis. So let's say that the green Z2, the green Z2 is a, is a, is a pi rotation about the X axis. And the red Z2 is a pi rotation about Z axis. Okay? So suppose we break the symmetry down to Z2 cross uh, Z2 left and Z2 right, and the S and S prime, they are the two spins on the two boundaries. And I want to write down a and I want to write down a Hamiltonian which couple these two spin and halves and preserves one single pi rotation about X axis, but it preserves uh, two doubled uh, pi rotation about Z axis. And this pretty much is the only Hamiltonian I can write down. Okay, this is the Hamiltonian I can write down. It's SZ times SZ prime. It's the two, it's the interaction between two uh, uh, spin and halves. Okay, 
You can see that this interaction does not does not trivialize the entire boundary state. Okay, does not trivialize the entire boundary state. Okay, the, initially the bound the you know the boundary will give you a fourfold degeneracy because each boundary will be three and a half in total is a fourfold degeneracy. So this interaction will break the fourfold degeneracy down to twofold degeneracy. Okay, the ground state for this Hamiltonian will be will be these two states. Okay. However, even though even though actually the ground state is is is, is like this, okay, it's non-trivial. The ground state of the boundary is non-trivial. We cannot access the non-trivial boundary states through this kind of correlation function. If I look at the SX SX correlation function at one boundary, I will still see a short-range correlation because the SX operator only flip SV at one boundary, does not flip SV on the other boundary. Okay, is that clear? If I take these two boundaries, these two ground states, and I calculate this uh, uh, SX SX correlation function along the temporal direction at one boundary, I'm still going to see short-range correlation. And this correlation function is precisely what is mapped to the type one strain correlator. Okay, so it means type one strain correlator probes what happens at one boundary. Okay, so type two strain correlator is is like this. Okay, it's like this. We actually cal calculate a uh, uh, calculate a uh, correlated correlation function between the two boundaries. Then this actually can be non-trivial because SX SX prime can flip one ground state to another. Okay, so this actually will be long range. Okay, this actually will be long range. So all the numerics can be intuitively understood using this uh, very simple picture. Okay, using this very simple picture. Okay, so interaction will actually still give me non-trivial boundary state, but the single boundary correlation function will be short range. It cannot connect to two ground states. Okay, two degenerate ground states, but the double, sorry, the kind of uh, this kind of correlation function can. Okay, this is why type two can remain non-trivial and why type one has to be trivial. Also, why screen operator has to be trivial. Okay, so this is 1D. Okay, so let me uh, maybe take a five, five more minutes to talk about two dimensional SPD states. Okay, for two dimensional SPD state, well, I mean, it's much harder to do numerics. Okay, it's much harder to, 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 to do numerics. But actually, effective field theory formally, then will still work. Okay, so uh, also about 10 years ago, uh, myself and Central have written down the wave function. Okay, wave function. For two for a class of a two-dimensional SPD state, for example, a two-dimensional SPD state with a U1 cross U1 symmetry. Again, let me use a green U1 and a red U1. And this wave function for SPD state is a superposition of all the n vector. N here is a four-component vector, four-component vector with a unit length. Okay, with a unit length. And then I sum over all the configuration of the n vector, and there's a weight here weight here for every configuration and this weight takes a very similar form as the West Sumino Witten model. Okay, West Sumino Witten model. But it's instead of a one plus one dimensional West Sumino Witten model, it becomes a two plus zero dimensional West Sumino Witten model. Okay, this is a West Sumino Witten term. Okay. So now you can imagine, so now you can see that if I want to calculate the strain correlator, it boils down to compute the correlation function of this uh, one plus one dimensional West Sumino Witten model, which I will be power law. Okay, we know everything about this model. It's a, it's a, you know, with all four symmetry, this model will, will be SC to level one CFT. With the U1 cross U1 symmetry, this model will give me, you know, some Latino liquid with some, with some Latino parameter, with some Latino parameter. And we have a U1 cross U1 symmetry. One U1 is for the phi, the other U1 is for theta. And the phi and the theta, they are like a dual boson. Uh, they are dual to each other in the one plus one dimensional bosonization formula. Okay, they're dual boson to each other. Okay, uh, each of them will carry what you want. Okay, so now again, so now again, let's try to let's try to break. Let, let, so let's try to turn on Diegel theorems. Okay, try to turn on Diegel theorems. Again, actually, uh, uh, suppose we don't turn on Diegel theorems, but we look at the density matrix, all the symmetries will be double. So we are dealing with a system with a two green U1 and a two red U1. Okay, two green U1 and two red U1. Okay, but suppose the Diegel theorems breaks uh, two green U1 to one green U1. So now actually this measure has the one green U1 and the two red U1. So what does this mean? Is that if I look at uh, the two boundaries, okay, two temporal boundaries, phi and the phi prime, theta and the theta prime, because I break the two green U1 to one diagonal U1, I can allow, I mean, I can turn off some term like this, cosine phi minus phi prime. Okay, this actually breaks the two double green U1 to diagonal U1. 
And in this term, I can, I can make it very strong, for example. If I make this term strong, it means that the phi minus phi prime channel is going to be gapped. Basically, yeah, all the minus channel will be gapped, or the plus channel will be gapless. Okay, the theta plus theta prime and phi plus phi prime will still be, still be gapless. So when this happens, it means that suppose I calculate the standard type one strain correlator, it's like calculating the theta theta correlation for e to i theta e to minus i theta correlation, it will be short range because this correlation function will have some mixture between, I mean, mixture of the minus channel, which, had, uh, which we know is going to be gapped out and short range. But actually, uh, the gap is uh, plus channel can only be probed, can only be probed through the type two strain correlator because we are calculating, because we are, sorry, because we are calculating something, we are calculating something which actually uh, uh, for, for, for both boundaries, okay, for, for both boundaries. So it means again, this is an example where the type one strain correlator will tell me that the system is trivialized by the decoherence, but type two strain correlator will still tell me the system remains non-trivial under this kind of decoherence, which breaks one of the two, uh, no, sorry, we, we, which breaks the one of the double the symmetry of the two U1 down to a diagonal U1 symmetry. Okay, is it clear? Okay, so I'm, I'm almost out of time. Should I still continue or, I mean, I can, I can stop here. You have 15 minutes for conclusion and questions. Okay, uh, maybe just, okay. Uh, okay, so maybe, maybe the one, one more story and then I will go to con conclusion, okay? So uh, in general, I mean, so, so, so just now I talked about looking at a strain correlator type one and type two. Actually, we can just look at this, okay? This, uh, this is called fidelity, okay? It's a, it's a trace of a two uh, density matrix, okay? Two density matrix. Of course, the, the definition for fidelity is generally more complicated, but actually if one of the density matrix the pure is reduced to a simpler form, which looks like this, okay? Simpler form, which looks like this. And we can also look at the log of Z. Okay, the log of Z is called the relative Renyi entropy, you know, it's some, has some quantum information name. But actually, uh, suppose the row C, okay, suppose the row C is a non trivial topological state, okay, non trivial topological state. Then actually, this trace it becomes a partition function, okay, it becomes, can be mapped into the partition function of the boundary states of the topological order. Okay, and Z is the partition function of the boundary state of the topological order. But suppose I turn on some interaction. If I turn on some interaction, sorry, if I turn on some uh, decoherence, decoherence is mapped to the interaction between the two boundaries, okay, then uh, this uh, Z becomes the partition function of the CFT, part, it becomes the partition function of the CFT, but actually there's some interaction between the CFT from the two, two boundaries, okay, from two bounds. So this interaction, can lead to some new CFT partition function. Okay, can lead to some new CFT partition function. So for example, if I should, so suppose this is a chain square, okay, suppose the chain square we start with, so we know that each boundary will have a chiral fermion, okay, have a chiral fermion. Then the decoherence is, is like turning on some interaction between the two boundaries, okay, turning on some interaction between the two boundaries. And this interaction, depending on the form and the symmetry, it can drive the, uh, Drive the part in the function into something something else, some some other some other CFT with a different uh, central charge, for example. Okay, so how do we know what kind of what kind of CFT the interaction? Sorry, what kind of CFT the decoherence uh, drive it into? So we can just uh, take this uh, uh, standard uh, formalism for extracting the central charge in the finite size scaling. So we can define this uh, quantity, okay, this relative entropy on a cylinder. Okay, on a cylinder with a long cylinder, which actually uh, uh, the L axis a length around the ring. It's, it's a length around the, around the cylinder. We can actually, actually extract how this F scale with L, how the F scale with L. Okay, so this term will give me what is the C, okay, what is central charge C. So we have tested this for the, for the uh, simplest uh, non interacting chain isolator. Okay, we take this uh, row as a density matrix, I mean, or the wave function as a density matrix of a pure state chain isolator. And this uh, uh, and this uh, row O is the uh, it's a trivial state, and we compute the overlap, and and, and uh, we try to uh, extract the C from the calculation, and it works pretty well. C equals one in this case, which corresponds to uh, uh, the non-intacting chiral fermion CFT. Okay, so that means actually we don't really have to calculate uh, the, the the strain correlator. We can just uh, take this uh, fidelity and try to compute the, uh, uh, the, the 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 central charge through this uh, finite size scale of uh, of F. Okay, so I think I will stop here. So let me go to the go to the uh, uh, go to the summary and outlook. Yeah. So first of all, I know this program is actually uh, 
has the has the word fractionalization in it, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't mention a word about fractionalization. So let me just say one thing that we learned about decoherence and fractionalization. So we tested uh, decoherence effect on states of matter with fractionalization. From what we can see, decoherence has a tendency to lead to confinement. Okay, has a tendency to lead to confinement. Which means that suppose we calculate like the correlation function between non-local operators, okay, like, like we have an anion anion correlation function, then there must be a string connecting them because the anion is not a anion is not a uh, uh, physical object. There must be some gauge, uh, some, some Wilson loop or Wilson line connecting them. Okay, so before decoherence, this Wilson line may have a power law correlation. Okay, it's possible, but under decoherence, actually decoherence can 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 ruin this. Okay, so decoherence has the potential. To confine the fractionalized object. Okay, but actually, this actually is a direction which actually uh, we only touch the tip of iceberg. I think there's a lot to study. There's a lot of a deconfined criticality, deconfined phases, a lot of order that we need to study their effect on decoherence. So here, I'm just saying that our current observation is that uh, decoherence has a tendency to confine anions, but I cannot really say that uh, that is a general situation. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, right. So let me just say that there are, there are a bunch of uh, uh, very much related works in the uh, in the last uh, last half a year, one year. I mean, there, there has been a surge of interest in uh, in uh, 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 especially SPD states on the decoherence SPD state uh, with a disorder. Many many uh, uh, studies are out there. So this is a very very exciting direction. So I hope that I convey the uh, uh, excitement to uh, to the audience. Okay, thank you for your uh, for your attention. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, at the weak uh, measurement, uh, you may have you'll see the at the critical point, you see two behavior. One is the uh, algebraic decay, another log decay. Oh. And uh, uh, what happens? Uh, what is decay? Uh, what uh, before your measurement? Uh, Oh, that's that, that just Wilson feature. I just a standard Wilson feature. Uh, 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 you have an algebraic decay? Yeah, yeah. It's a power law decay, but the, 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 the decay is like d minus 2 plus eta over 2, then eta is given precisely by the, by, by the Wilson feature. I see. Kind of eta. So basically, it's that uh, before measurement uh, for both behavior, uh, you have a, a power law. Oh, okay. yeah. And uh, I see that depend on some strength measurement. Then you, the parallel decay may remain to be parallel, maybe you stick in the corner, but yes. sometimes it may, may become uh, stronger. It's absolutely in a lot, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering, so here you have a uh, uh, Two symmetries from uh, when, when we talk about uh, the density matrix, they have a symmetry like denoted by L and the right. And I'm wondering whether it's possible to have an anomaly between them. Oh yeah, that's a extremely good question. I think we 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 explore that possibility, but so far we haven't found a good example. There's a mixed anomaly between them, so. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question, but I don't know the answer because we, we don't have an example of uh, the existence of a mixed anomaly between them. But actually, we have a mixed anomaly between the Z2, L, Z2, R, and another Z2. Yeah, sorry? Yeah, the, the example we gave is Z2 with the, the diagonal. Yeah, with, with the diagonal one, but, but not, 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 not the Z2 between, this, between the left and right of this matrix. That's, that's the one we haven't found. You know, may, maybe, that, maybe there shouldn't be such a case. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. We have a question from our Zoom attendees from over here. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, at what limit of weak measurements does the strange correlate, correlator diagnosis strategy break down? Uh, well, first of all, if they're, if they're decoherence, well, I mean, yeah, so, so first of all, symmetry is the most important thing. If the decoherence break enough symmetry, for example, in, in both cases, in both examples I presented, if their decoherence breaks their both double symmetry to diagonal symmetry, then we know for sure that the 
the, the, the strain correlator actually will, will, will give me a trivial, will give short range correlation. I mean, let me just show you one example here. For example, suppose, I mean, this is the Hamiltonian that we have when we have like one green Z2 and the two red Z2, but suppose both Z2 are diagonal. Suppose I only have like one green Z2 and one red Z2, then I can write down Hamiltonian, which is S dot S, sort of S dot S prime. And we know very well the ground state for that guy is gonna be a singlet. So all correlation, no matter what you marry, it's gonna be short range correlated, okay? And actually, if, if you're asking about the, at what strength, uh, the, the, the decoherence will, will ruin this. Uh, that's a good question. That, that's something uh, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe at some critical strains, the, uh, the, uh, the whole perturbative kind of analysis will break down. But, but I, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what, what is the critical point of the strength of the decoherence where I mean, it's, it's going to ruin this. Thank you. Sorry, I have another question. Um, have you thought about uh, applying this to maybe chiral topological order to expect uh, things to be different from chiral topological order? Uh, well, fraction quantum hall. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Precisely. So, 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 yeah. So we we so so we've done this calculation for the change vector. It's a chiral invertible t uh, invertible topological order. So we haven't really tried the fraction quantum hall. Uh, it's certainly worth doing, I, I, I think so. Uh, but actually the, the basic picture will be similar though. So basically the, the fraction of the whole will have some, some, uh, some non-trivial uh, some non-trivial conformal field theory. So this will become some, uh, uh, you know, decoherence will become some interaction between two uh, chiral uh, uh, interacting CFT, you know, so the partition, fun the partition function of, uh, of uh, two chiral, of the partition function of interacting uh, two copies of a chiral CFT. It can it can give you some very interesting result. You know, it can it can have some RG flow to flow to some other new CFT fixed point maybe. Yeah, it's, it's certainly certainly worth doing. But it's, it, there's a zoo of it's, there's a zoology of a topical order there that we haven't uh, studied. But uh, you know, if I want to study, this is the first quality I will I will try to look at. Yeah, I think I, th I think Biao has a has a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so this picture of pass integral understanding of weak measurement is uh, very interesting. But for, for this picture to be uh, valid, because pass integral is uh, something like uh, involving local Lagrangians, so do you uh, require the weak measurement to have uh, to be measured in some local basis? Yes, yes, it has to be some local decoherence. Um, yeah, you are, you are absolutely right. Yeah. I see, otherwise you, you can't use pass integral. Uh, otherwise, it's going to. I, I'm not exactly sure what, what will happen actually. It will become some very non-local, I mean, you know, see, so, so, so right now I said that the, 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 the new term, new term that we, 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 we turn on is some non-local interaction between temporal boundaries, but they are local in space, right? But if you have non-local decoherent channel, it, it will be all non-local, then it's gonna be much harder to, I, I think it's gonna be much harder to analyze, although not impossible, yeah, but you know, yeah, we, we, yeah, as I said, we, I mean, this is something we just started exploring. There are a lot of different uh, interesting questions one can ask after, after all this. I see. Thanks. Uh, I, I imagine there's a much of a generative interaction which may not be unitary. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, yes. Is that a fact of calculation? Yeah, it's it's a very good question, and in fact, uh, especially in this kind of strain correlator and this kind of calculation, we have to worry about unitarity. You know, so it, it's not such big worry when we calculate like the, the first part of the talk. So when when we calculate trace row, we calculate trace row. Actually, sometimes actually the non non permission or non intuitive thing cancels out when we take a trace because we identify a true boundary or something. But here, a non-permission or non-unitary thing can really emerge. So we need some we need some extra reflection symmetry, for example, for the chain threader to actually uh, make sure this uh, boundary. I mean, this CFT is a uh, unitary CFT. At least we can use some uh, uh, extra reflection symmetry to guarantee that uh, all the non-unitary terms will be irrelevant. Yeah, indeed. We are, Right. I mean, we, we, we need some extra, some extra reflex symmetry to guarantee that uh, it's a unitary CFT. Otherwise, we have to invoke some non-unitary CFT. Uh, stuff. I see. So here, the theory is uh, non-unitary, but they are 
Yes, right, yeah. In, in, so, yeah, right. So, in the IR, actually. But it's more interesting because some non interesting yes. uh, relevant, you make a new fixed point. Definitely, definitely. Actually, uh, uh, the strain correlator and this overlap, the strain correlator has been used by, by people who are more familiar with non neutral CFT as a tool to <laughs> generate non neutral CFT, actually. You know, they, you know it's, 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 not, it's not what we intended. At the beginning, but they, they have used that to, that's a, as a way to generate non nuclear CFT, which usually is not so easy to, 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 to generate. Uh, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, just to understand like the experimental feasibility of this, uh, would the protocol be to have an L by L lattice perform weak measurements on this L by L lattice and then maybe post select on the L by L lattice? And if so, does that mean the, the, the number of computations you have to do is exponential and elsewhere? Actually, actually not quite, D depending, on, depending on what. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, so my talk is, contains different parts. So some parts need uh, uh, post-selection, some do not. So actually, uh, my, my collaborator, Jiang Yang, actually uh, uh, showed that actually uh, for the type 1 strain correlator, actually without post-selection, you can still marry it. Uh, you know, basically, it's like marrying a string operator. You know, but it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. But for type 2 strain correlator, indeed, there's a problem of how to marry it. You know, it's very difficult. But for type 1 strain correlator, indeed, I think uh, uh, my, my collaborator showed that uh, you, can, you, can, you can do it you know, without, without post-selection. Um, I know sometimes you can think of measurement as gauging a symmetry. I wonder so again, if you can sometimes think of measurement as gauging some symmetry. Uh, I wonder if you can understand this weak measurement in terms of gauging the left and right uh, symmetries you talked about. Very Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why measurement can be thought of as gauging. Uh, oh, uh, suppose you measure and find that uh, n is equal to 1 for n the boson number. It's kind of like I can gauge a U1 symmetry, oh. and then everything collapses that equals zero, and I can shift to. I, I, uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the mixed amount of question I was asked to the right of the room, so. Uh, well, sorry, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I haven't thought, of, sorry, so, so, so the weak merriment, uh, that I, I haven't made the connection uh, in terms of uh, how to connect the weak measurement to coupling the system to a gauge field. You know, this, this is something I, I, I haven't thought about. But, but for, for, for the other part, the mixed anomaly of D2L and D2R, indeed, if there is a mixed anomaly, it has to show up in some kind of effective action you want to engage them. Uh, yeah, that, that, that'll be having found the example of SPD state, which can generate a, uh, like a, a transign, mutual transignment term between or, or some or some a cup a term for between the two z two between the z two left and z two right. We haven't found a state uh, like that yet. Okay. So any other questions? Um, uh, are there any new phases that you can obtain under decoherence that we don't see without decoherence? Uh, I think the extraordinary log is actually pretty new. Uh, I think I think it's uh, that's a new physics. Uh, yeah. So so for. Say again, sorry. I guess I meant new phases, not. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. That's that's there. There, there was a recent paper about. Uh, uh, more, more, more recent paper about uh, intrinsic decohered SPD phases. Uh, I, I, I haven't read the paper very carefully yet, so I, I, I cannot comment on that. But uh, there are certainly, you know, I mean, yeah. So, so obviously, once we have this double symmetry picture, right? Then actually, uh, the very natural question, as, as was asked before, is that uh, can we think about the system with new anomalies, you know, which actually is not descendant of the of the original. Uh, SPD state, right? So uh, there were some works about that, but since I have not read it carefully yet, I, 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 I cannot comment on that. But this is a, a well, recently, this, you know, works along this line is really serving a lot of papers about, about, about this. 
Okay, so if there's no questions, let's thank uh, Professor.